and the start man. Uh, my session is going to be on uh, achieving this faster turnaround in Java development. Uh, we will look at different approaches that you, you can take to save time uh, when you're developing Java code. Um, the slides are supposed to have a logo there, but I couldn't find one, so you'll see your logo there. And I also had to uh, switch the laptops at the last minute, so maybe I can't show the demos, but they were either way just five minutes, so no problem there. Okay, about myself, I'm a developer of, of a product called Java Rebel. Uh, I work at an Estonian Java shop, basically a company that develops uh, Java software for uh, mainly the uh, Estonian telecoms. Okay, now, now it's also in, in Europe. So telecoms, uh, health, and so on. So we have this uh, large-scale uh, Java enterprise uh, applications. And this company is about 10 years old, and this is what it basically does. In the past years, it has also gone to .NET, but it's mainly a Java shop. And this is where I've worked for the past years. Uh, other public projects that I've done is suggesting Weaver and this uh, Aranea web application platform that's about three or four years old now. And uh, you can find me on my, my blog at Downgrade. So we downgrade stuff there. Okay, about the presentation. First, we'll, we'll see what this turnaround time is. And then we'll uh, see how can we uh, decrease it. So we'll look at different containers or uh, and frameworks, uh, project structure, and so on. And then some slides about stuff that I can cover it here. If you have any questions during the presentation, just raise your hand and ask the question. I'm a, I'm not a native speaker of English, so I might not understand you, but if you go really slow, I can get you. Okay, now uh, turnaround time. So, what is it? It's uh, basically the time when you see your changes happen. So, when you're developing an application and you're writing the, whatever technology code you're writing, you want to see the result. And in PHP or Python or Ruby, it's, it's really simple. You just uh, add some code and uh, you can uh, just uh, see the changes happen either in PHP. Uh, on the web, you, you just can refresh the page and then you'll, you'll see stuff happen. And the same is for other dynamic languages like Python or Ruby. But in, in the Java world, especially the enterprise, enterprise vision, it's uh, Quite difficult because once you make a change uh, uh, to a bean or uh, even 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 a servlet, you you have to deploy your application, so uh, or redeploy your application, and uh, this can take some time. Or uh, you can either redeploy or restart the container. So it it, it takes about thirty seconds even to start an empty JBoss on a high end machine. By high end, I, I mean to all for a couple of gigahertz. So you, you, you spend so much time waiting. So if there's a big app, it, it will redeploy uh, a long time. So the largest applications that we have at our company, they can uh, deploy for 10 minutes. And so when you're a developer, so you try to crank in uh, as many changes as you can and then do the redeployment or even if you're uh, using a desktop development, you still at one point have to test stuff in the container. And if, if you get something wrong and uh, want to change it, then uh, you have another 10 minutes or, or eight or something like that. Uh, why is it that this turnaround time important for uh, developers is uh, basically context switches. So if you're focused on the task, and uh, you're, you're fixing something or, or you're developing something. Every time you have to wait for the changes to propagate, you're, you're basically doing context switches from, from one task to another or uh, from one task to slash that or something else. 
And uh, from the manager's perspective, especially at our company where we ba basically uh, sell developers hours, it's, it's uh, really important because uh, this is uh, basically just wasted money and time. So uh, managers even uh, uh, like to decrease the turnaround time more than the developers. But developers can have coffee and cigarettes, so they, they usually uh, like it. As uh, I've been working on this Java role project where we actually see the different configurations that uh, uh, different uh, application developers are using. So we, we see uh, lots of this, uh, uh, if, if you know the term, this uh, daily what the fucks. <laughs> so uh, you can see applications that when uh, people are uh, uh, deploying stuff to the app server, they're uh, first uh, compressing all their stuff to either R files or EER files or jar files. So you can see that they do maybe four uh, compressions uh, before they deploy their app. And if, if you have dozens of files, then uh, okay, it, it will take maybe 20 seconds. But well, you, you still have to even invoke the tools. And if you're using Java based tools like Ant, then it's, it's uh, not an overhead. Uh, what people else do is that uh, they do this multiple compilations. So if, if you have your IDE and if it does compilation for you, so there's there's no point in uh, invoking another Ant script to uh, compile your stuff, package it, and then deploy. So you, you could be using the output of the IDE, but we will really get it that uh, later on. So the, the largest uh, turnaround time that we we've, we've seen was a. Uh, big application at the uh, uh, European Telco where it was at 25 minutes. So once you wanted to see or change or, or uh, see that everything is fine, you have to wait 25 minutes because the uh, application is uh, just redeploying somewhere. And so mm -hmm. if you imagine a large application, you have, you have the ER, you have a couple of AG, AGB modules, you have a couple of web applications and so on. <coughs> so you just wait until they redeploy. I don't know if, if anybody of you knows how many uh, mouse clicks it, it takes to deploy an application to WebLogic 9. Okay, no WebLogic users here, but it's, it's uh, quite funny how the uh, vendors uh, make it so difficult that if, if you want to deploy an app to WebLogic and if you're actually doing testing there, it, it, it takes uh, about 20 clicks. So you, you, you just click through the user interface to deploy an app. Of course, you can uh, use Ant scripts to do that, but the out of the box solutions are quite funny. So, I guess the same is for uh, Glassfish or WebSphere, WebSphere, but uh, a bit more normal. So, it's uh, quite time consuming and nerve consuming even for uh, developers. Uh, now, we'll uh, look at how to choose the um, containers or uh, development containers. Uh, we will look at uh, frameworks, uh, project structure, and probably build structure. And uh, with these, how to increase the uh, turnover time. OK, let's uh, start out with this uh, development uh, containers. So even though if, if your client requests uh, a uh, Monster app server, uh, let it be uh, WebLogic, Glassfish, JBoss, or, or uh, WebSphere, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to develop in it. So if, if you take these lightweight containers, especially Jetty, uh, you can uh, start the server that fast that you can't even, uh, well, you can't do a context switch because it's, it's blatantly fast. And, uh, Jetty and Tomcat are the best examples. Although I, I know uh, projects that, that use uh, Jetty as the development uh, container and Tomcat as the uh, production uh, container. And uh, you can, of course, uh, start these uh, through uh, different uh, tools, like Eclipse has this web tools project that, that you, you can just uh, click up a couple of uh, buttons and then an application server or a container starts up and uh, it will auto deploy stuff there. 
but you have to be sure uh, what they actually do because if, if you take the Webtools project and then see how it starts your JBoss and then deploys your apps there, it, it actually does uh, so many compressions and decompressions to your uh, application that it, when, when you actually see it, that you, you want something to be changed. And if you do t testing in uh, other containers or lightweight containers, you, you still need to test in the target containers because otherwise you'll you can run into serious problems when they differ a lot, although the implementation says that they both uh, conform to the same specs. So, uh, containers also uh, support this hot deploy, which uh, people tend to like for I don't know what reasons, but what this hot deploy is that you, you can uh, or this container will uh, monitor for uh, changes in your application. So it will either uh, check the timestamps of the class files or uh, configuration files. And usually this hot deploy is either uh, on by default or uh, you can uh, configure it yourself. So WebLogic, Tomcat, Resin have it. So I guess others also, you just have to find the configuration or uh, write the uh, monitoring code yourself. And I know that this hot deploy is really difficult to turn off for resin. So somebody just wants you to use it all the time. Uh, so what does happen in the background if, if you change the class and the timestamp changes or change the configuration? So uh, actually a complex reload for the application. So uh, your, your spring, your hibernate or whatever framework or uh, uh, or a mapping gear you're using the uh, configuration is uh, reloaded. Uh, so you don't save that much time, except for uh, you don't have to press the button yourself. And uh, that's it. So you don't uh, decrease your uh, turnaround that much uh, because you could do it manually and then it's just a couple of seconds. So this uh, hub deploy sounds cool and sexy, but you take that cool. So, okay, uh, project uh, structure. Uh, depending on the size, you, you can have a very complex structure. So, if, even if you look at the legacy apps or, or a new application, uh, you can uh, actually use a uh, the deployment structure for your project structure. Okay, th there are going to be a couple of differences, but on the next slides, we we'll, we'll see how how we can overcome them. So. By mimicking deployment structure, I mean that uh, you use actually the structure for the project that you use for deployment. So if you have a web app, you'll have your web in, uh, classes and libs with uh, libraries. Uh, or uh, if, you, if you have uh, AGB modules, you'll, you'll use the same structure. So you, you don't have to do the uh, copying in, in your build scripts. Uh, it's just quite common that when you build your Build an application, uh, I mean, like and build or uh, whatever uh, build structure is, is used. Uh, you take the configuration files from the configuration directory, you take the classes from uh, your classes directory, then uh, zip them together in a different uh, folder structure, deploy to the application server, and then it's un uncompressed there. Once your application is large, you have uh, 4,000 class files, 2,000 class files. The, you're, you're basically just copying class files every time and the, the same goes for libraries. I know you, you don't want to uh, duplicate your libraries and so on, but there are other ways that how you can uh, make sense of it. So, uh, at the same time you can uh, avoid these multiple compilations. So, uh, if you're NetBeans or your Eclipse or I don't know about the LEJ. When when you're coding it, it gives you this uh, feedback if you have errors or so. What it does actually, it's it's compiling the code in the background, and uh, you can actually use that compiled code. So if if you deploy your app in in uh, development mode, uh, then there is uh, no reason to uh, recompile it. So you're you're doing development uh, and. Uh, you don't want to wait for it, and as you, by default, get this output, so just just use it. So 
check where your uh, IDE is compiling your classes and uh, try to use them in, in, uh, in your uh, deployment. And the same goes for, for uh, compression and decompression. <laughs> so, uh, exploded format is uh, quite uh, comfortable in, in uh, development mode. And uh, the, the only reason why you want to use unexploded is if, if you have your app server on a network and uh, you, you have to pop it there. So this is where you can't use the exploded one, but whenever you have the chance, so you just uh, explode it up. So uh, the uh, different uh, clients that we, we've had at our booth, uh, they, they always say that they, even in testing, they use ER files, they use WAR files. So it's, it's basically wasting time if, if you have the app server on the same machine. So you could save it then. If, if you imagine a project takes, uh, maybe a developer is in a project for one year, so uh, this, this all adds up and uh, you, you actually don't want it to. And when the managers find out, then they'll probably make you change something. Uh, this project structure that, if, if you have this uh, a bit abstract structure that you have stuff in, in uh, one place, and it doesn't conform to the deployment structure, you can always use it as symbolic, symbolic links. So uh, you can, uh, with, with most containers, you can even uh, link applications to your uh, container. So you, you don't have to do the copying. And, and it, it's also true for Windows. So it's, it, symbolic links is, is uh, not just a uh, Linux or a Unix thing. You, and on Windows, you, we get the best uh, file system, you have these junction points that are not that easy to use as, as symbolic links on, on Linux, but uh, once you Google for them and then uh, read, read through the uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia article, then, then you'll see that you either uh, have to do it from the command line or uh, download an application that does it for you. So you can say no to this uh, copying. Uh, some containers need uh, special configurations for the uh, symbolic links to work, but it's, it's usually you just invest the 10 minutes to go through the documentation or, or a cooling for it, and uh, you can just link your apps to uh, your container or link the libraries to your app, or, or you can link the uh, ID uh, output directory of the class mm -hmm. files to your web -in classes or wherever you hold your classes for the deployment. So this saves a lot of time. Uh, framework hot reload. So this is another uh, cool uh, feature that you can uh, hot reload uh, changes. We'll uh, look into how it's done, but what, what this means is that it will reload your classes. Uh, meaning that if, if you change your classes and it, it this framework has up reload the uh, feature. You you can only reload the classes, meaning that if, if you have your configuration files, uh, uh, so it, it won't reload those. Uh, how to deal with that is uh, trying to use that uh, use uh, this uh, programmatic configuration, meaning that the configuration is also in the source code, either in the uh, sense of annotations. Or, or uh, just configuration code in, in plain old Java. And uh, if you use framework hot reload, then it's, it's possible to uh, uh, reload uh, even the configuration. So if, if you're adding a, a controller or uh, a view with annotations and then your framework supports uh, hot reload, you can uh, see these uh, changes happen uh, much quicker because Hot reload, it, it doesn't do a deploy, meaning that it, it won't reload your uh, hibernate, that it, it won't reload your uh, spring board. So you can uh, uh, get a lot of uh, that faster turnaround. And so you, if the configuration is, is in files, you can't take advantage of it. And the, I just have a list of applications that, uh, uh, frameworks that I know use annotation based configuration. <coughs> And it's also a feature of the Spring 2.5 that some of the configuration can be done in annotations. 
uh, choose stripes and we can uh, uh, with with those most of the configuration is in inside your Java uh, classes. So you can just reload them. Okay, but what does this uh, framework hot reload uh, uh, do? So uh, when you add functionality to your Java classes, you're uh, compiling your stuff in the background. And you're you're compiling your classes to the uh, location that the uh, application server is using. So uh, this hot reload will uh, serialize your session. It will drop the instances, so all the object state that you have. It will uh, drop the class loader, <coughs> recreate the class loader, and will basically recreate everything. So you will lose a state, but uh, so uh, plus it, it might work and it, it uh, might not work. So it's it's fifty fifty. And as you lose the instances, you probably have to keep the uh, uh, click through your application to to get to the state that you were at. And so this regression might be a success or, or not. And just keep in mind that this, this won't reload your configuration. So you have to have to do that uh, redeploy for, for that thing. But if, if we look at, for example, Tapestry, so the, the last stable version is 4.1. Uh, so this is 2008, and we're, we're trying to uh, decrease the turnaround time. So the stable version uh, only reloads your templates in, in development mode. And the same can be said about different uh, frameworks that it's, it's not actually here in, in the sense that it's, it's usable. So for a tapestry uh, version less than 5 or it is stable currently, so you can't reload any classes. Or uh, if you want to do that, you, you just have to redeploy it. But 5, five plus, uh, you can already do it. You have to be in exploded format. So you can't update your EER file, but you, you can just uh, update your class files. And all instances are, are dropped, as I previously said. And uh, same goes for uh, class loaders. And the session data is preserved. But it, it's, it's uh, not that easy with such solutions when your framework supports hot, hot uh, relay, uh, there are always some problems. Uh, for example, with, with Tapestry, you can't uh, hold any references to, to cer certain framework objects. And if, if you do that, you'll uh, run into different problems, either memory leaks or class cast exceptions. Because if, if you try to drop everything and you load the same name in a new class loader, and the other new instance off or something similar, so you'll get plus plus exceptions with the same names. But it's it's not that safe. Uh, it 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 will still save you some uh, some time. Okay, there's also this uh, on the fly loading. <coughs> for its uh, first, first the hot sweat. So if I guess I have slides for each of them. Yeah. So hot sweat. Fast swap and uh, then this is Java Rebel. Uh, hot swap. So if you're in the, uh, debugging mode or debug mode, uh, and you when you do remote uh, debugging and you connect to the uh, uh, application, you can uh, change the method bodies. Uh, so you have to be in debug mode, and once you're connected to the server, you can uh, change the contents of your methods. It's it's not that cool because uh, well, there isn't much you should that you want to uh, change your method. You usually want to add some methods or classes and so on. So uh, uh, this is a serious uh, limitation. I had a demo prepared with the other laptop, but not to. Not with this one, so I may demo for, for, for this, and even can get very confused with this uh, hot swap because once you're in the debug mode and change something, so your your debugger will, will start giving you different error messages once you do something that you're, you're not allowed to either adding methods or changing signatures. Then at one point you actually don't know what the state is uh, on the server side. So this can uh, lead to this interesting bug hunts. Uh, this uh, fast swap is a uh, feature of uh, web logic. Uh, the last time I checked, checked it a couple of months ago, it was in uh, web logic ten some 
data release, and it uh, reloads some changes to your class one. So when we saw hard swap, they reloaded the method bodies with uh, fast swap uh, with web logic. Then you can uh, uh, reload more stuff. You can uh, add methods and uh, classes and uh, fields and so on, and it will reload that. So you you don't have to redeploy. You just enable this feature and. Uh, when you're making changes to the uh, source files and you're compiling it, it will reload the uh, new classes. So this fast swap has uh, different limitations as uh, turns out I'm saying that no reflection support, but that was a couple of months ago. Maybe, maybe they have now some reflection support or something similar. So this, this means that mm -hmm. when your frameworks uh, rely on the reflection API for either finding your controllers or uh, some functionality, this won't get reflected in the uh, fast swap update. Uh, then we also have a Java Rebel. Uh, this is a uh, new product that uh, works on uh, different app servers and uh, desktop applications that also loads uh, changes to class files. So while you're in, uh, while you're developing your application, you can. Uh, Change the code on the fly just as we pass swap or fast swap. But th this one has the uh, different uh, features that the others don't. So you can uh, on the fly add uh, classes and uh, methods and annotations. So you're uh, basically saving saving the time of redeployment just as we uh, the the uh, fast swap or hard swap. But you, you can have more uh, changes. I know that uh, this uh, computer also should have a Tomcat running with uh, Java Rebel, so I can show you one demo, but I'll uh, just quickly check I'll, as I had to change the laptop just five minutes before I didn't have the chance to change the files. So I'll uh, just make it a bit bigger for you to see. So I'll have it in 16. So Okay, it did seems normal. So, and and I'll check the source code for a second. That uh, all the changes have been made to. And okay, I think the demo is ready now. So, okay, the Tomcat was shut down. Okay, I think I have have it right here. So my my, my Tomcat is uh, starting up right now, and I have deployed a uh, application to it. The application is a uh, uh, Spring uh, framework uh, sample application uh, with a very. Uh, so, okay. For example, here, here I have a form that uh, lets you add owners, and these uh, fields are required here. So with with this uh, hot swap utilities, hot swap or fast swap with 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 Java, you can uh, go to the uh, source code and uh, make a change here in uh, when you're developing, and this. Uh, I'm using Eclipse here, so whenever I say it, it actually compiles. So, and once I go back, it uh, will uh, reload the uh, validator class, uh, meaning that you, you save the time of uh, redeployment. So you can uh, uh, do different changes, so depending on uh, which utility you use. So if I introduce a method here, so I'll put some validation. So I created a new method and the validation goes here and I make a change here and uh, compile in the background so I see that uh, it has reloaded that too so usually you would be making uh, redeployments and uh, when, when you do some bigger changes like uh, take the uh, class name itself and rename it to let's say uh, something new 
So with this uh, new set of tools, you can uh, even uh, get the turnaround even faster. I will have to make a change here to, to, for you to see that it's doing something. So, so the next one is uh, not uh, required. And at the same time, you will see that, that uh, some classes are reloaded, uh, no redeployment is, uh, takes place. So this is something that you can use in uh, development mode when you want to check, uh, save the time of uh, redeploying your app. And oh, Hotswap is a general solution. This plus swap is, is very large and specific, and Jabrabu is also a generic solution. So you can use this for uh, desktop applications as well. Either you're developing Swing apps or, or uh, Eclipse plugins, so you don't have to use like, the other Eclipse or the, the Swing application. Okay, uh, I guess one of the slides are here. And uh, the Java Rebel part is that the same is for a hot swap is that you can use whatever IDE you want to, as long as you're here compiling your classes somewhere that the application server. KVM can find them from. And so uh, the deployment times are the largest in the uh, enterprise edition world. And the uh, installations of these uh, different utilities is usually one line to the configuration. So with Hotswap, you just have to uh, make sure that your server is uh, running in log mode. With Fastswap, you have to make sure you have web logic. And with Java, we just have a Java agent added to the uh, JVM of the uh, application server that you're running on. Okay, then uh, we have the Eclipse JDG compiler. So you, you might think that, okay, it's, it's just another compiler, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely faster than the regular Java C when, it, when this comes to uh, small updates to class files. Secondly, you won't have these uh, compilation errors that you usually uh, have with uh, the regular compiler. So uh, there's a one thing with this uh, JVT compiler that uh, let's make a uh, change to the source file that will result in a uh, compilation error. Like usually, when you compile stuff that has an, uh, <coughs> that has a compilation error in it. It will compile. It will say that uh, line seven uh, undefined variable or sim similar. So let's just uh, make a mistake here. So this is obviously a mistake. And uh, once we uh, try to use this new class, this Eclipse JDT compiler will compile it. And let's just try to use it uh, at the validation part. I'll try to get the error bigger. Larger. So this is the Java Lang error of the compilation problems. We have a syntax error somewhere. But what happens in the background is that uh, Eclipse JDT will compile your class. It, as it uh, finds the, uh, uh, in this case, the mistake in a, in a method body, it will uh, replace the method body with a uh, throw clause of an uh, exception. So you will still get your classes compiled but once you use them, you will uh, be aware of the uh, uh, exceptions. So you can even uh, in, in testing use use classes that have uh, mistakes in, in them. So it, it might not sound that useful, but one, once you use it, you, you find that it has its own place. Okay. Uh, and it also speeds up container a JSP compilation. We'll, we'll have a slide about it or two. So, however, it is a JSP uh, uh, executed on the server side. Let's say I, I have a JSP in the uh, point in an application and I'll, I'll make a HTTP request to it. So, uh, first of all, the uh, server is translated to a, uh, to a Java file. Uh, secondly, the Java file is compiled and then it's loaded. It usually has an uh, anonymous name, so you can uh, reload them as many times you want to, and then it's, it, it, it gets executed. But how, how it is configured in the servlet container is that the, the uh, servlet container has its own uh, this web XML that's a global one, and it has only uh, mapped a uh, servlet 
on the JSP extension or whatever JSP extensions might be using, or the default ones uh, like JSP or JSPX and so on. So actually you have a servlet in the uh, container that does this translation, compilation and uh, uh, loading. This means that you, what you can do is you can take a wrapper uh, servlet that uses uh, Eclipse uh, JDT compiler and, and uh, do the compilation themselves. So for example, if you take the Oracle containers that are really slow on uh, compiling the JSPs, so you, you can just replace it with this Eclipse JDT. Uh, Eclipse JDT compiler comes with uh, Jasper, the Tomcat, uh, JSP Engine 5.5. So uh, why is it important is that uh, the bottleneck is, is not the translation or loading the classes or executing the uh, methods, but uh, it's the compilation part. This has been especially true when uh, you always have to spawn a new task for the uh, Java compiler. With, with the later versions of Java, I guess it was with, with version 6 uh, that you don't have to invoke another instance, but you can uh, like pro programmatically call the compiler. So it, it has gone a bit faster, but uh, there are not so many uh, users in, in uh, large-scale apps that, that use uh, Java 6 nowadays. So it, it takes time. So if you replace your uh, uh, JSP servlet with, with the one that is JDT, you'll, you'll uh, definitely speed up the uh, uh, JSP reloading. So once you uh, use Altad to check the browser and it's loading, you want Altad to slash that. So you, you can stay focused. And uh, you, you just need a custom wrapper for it. And this, you, Jasper, you can use out of the box for most of the containers, and uh, I know for sure that it works with Jet and Tomcat, but I haven't configured it for any other containers. And if it doesn't work out of the box, it's, it's open source and you can write your own wrapper, it's, it's not that difficult. And then comes the question that if you're in any development mode, uh, you can even uh, speed this up a bit more with, uh, with uh, inter interpreting the uh, JSP. So you can skip the compilation part because uh, the uh, interpreting is even, even, even faster. It isn't faster than uh, uh, just invoking a method on an already compiled servlet, but it's, it's uh, faster than, than doing the compilation. So every time you change something small uh, with the usual compiler, the, the whole class is recompiled with Eclipse JDK it will just find the uh, changes. So, unless you're using Eclipse JDT, you can uh, use a uh, product called JSP Weaver, which interprets uh, JSP files. So, it, it uh, supports different specs, not 2.1, but it's, it's another solution if, if you don't want to use the Eclipse JDT compiler. And in, in development, these, uh, even these uh, small uh, uh, Time setting operations, they, they add up because you actually do this stuff for, for weeks or, or even months. So, uh, this is definitely something that you can take advantage of. And it's, it's uh, JSP Weaver is a commercial product, but the Cliff JDT compiler is uh, an open source, so it, it, it won't uh, steal you anything. Okay. Uh, dynamic languages. Mm. Well, first of all, we have this JSR uh, two two three that uh, sounds cooler than it is. You can so you have this uh, scripting in the Java platform, so you can uh, have have scripts in different languages that we definitely reload uh, without redeploy. But well, I haven't seen in web applications anybody using them. Then you also have the dynamic languages, but there the speed gains uh, thing comes from that you can be more expressive. You can uh, do stuff in uh, less code, and uh, the, the frameworks of the dynamic languages have, have more possibilities to support this hot reload as we saw from in the, in the Java frameworks, because uh, uh, they will also reload changes for you, but 
we'll, we'll probably have to wait till this uh, really kicks off. So today it's, it's not that uh, uh, popular or, or well known and uh, you, you can't use this very well in, in legacy applications. And then the, uh, this, for example, uh, Scala, which I, uh, is a, another new language. Well, not that new. It, it was first developed in 1998, and it has reached more maturity. Uh, it has uh, started to take off with Scala and, and its framework lift. Uh, Java, uh, Scala comes bundled with free Java Rebel, so you can uh, reload all your changes to uh, Scala files uh, on the fly. So again, you don't have to redeploy your app. Uh, then, out usually the question is, but I use out of the container to test it, so I don't have this problem. Well, when you actually do out of the container uh, testing, you you will be mocking your uh, uh, different uh, either server spec or uh, whatever framework you're using. You still, when running the tests, you'll, you'll have to wait till your uh, environment is set up. So, okay, it's, it's cool that you, you have lost the application server uh, from it, but if, if you want to do change lookup, you still have to set up a service. If you want to ask beans from the spring, you still have to uh, set up spring. So, uh, these uh, different approaches that I told you about previously, it doesn't mean that you can't do out of the container testing. It's just something that works with them as well, and you still have the turnaround problem in, in out of container testing. So, uh, okay, basically, I'm done with the slides. We have uh, 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers. So, if, if anybody has any questions, so yeah. How did JavaScript How did it actually manage to Well, first of all, it, it integrates with the JVM as a Java agent. So it does some uh, uh, bytecode manipulation there. And secondly, it integrates with the class loaders. So it, uh, it will monitor or it will actually can check for the timestamps of, of your class files and then load the new bytecode while uh, preserving all the instances. So, yeah. Okay, Hotswap lets you, uh, Hotswap is free, comes bundled with the JDK, uh, uh, you have to have development modes for it. Fastswap is very much specific, uh, you can, uh, besides uh, change method bodies, you can uh, add methods and change their signatures, uh, add classes and so on. So, the, and it comes with web logic, so it, it, it increase, it, you don't have to be in development mode. So, Hotspot is just for method bodies, so you don't use it a lot. You just happen to use it by accident, usually. When you want to change it, then you have just set the frame point, you have to hit it, and you see, okay, I have to change this minus to a plus, and it will reload it. While Hotspot, you can actually use for uh, development. So, this is like, even if you're taking it last. Yeah. Uh, depends on this hot deploy because uh, it depends how it's configured. Because usually you can uh, tell that, okay, monitor for these classes or monitor for these uh, uh, descriptor files. And once it sees a change, it will hot deploy. So you have to really know what you're doing because otherwise, if you, if you configure your stuff to comply to the uh, location that the application server is using, you can be making uh, so many deploys that. Uh, one, one time you, you don't know what's happening if your, your computer is hung. But for Apache Compact, it runs as a housekeeping Uh, you just don't have to press the button yourself. 
That's it. So how fast swap works here? How I mean, is it better than a hot swap? It works in simple. Or what was the question? This is proprietary to the cloud. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, we're much specific with a beta release. Uh, it's a beta release. So. I have a question that uh, uh, does hot swap or even uh, fast swap works when we are using reflection? Uh, fast swap has problems with reflection, and uh, with hot swap we can't uh, do any reflective changes because you're just changing method bodies. So with, with reflection, you, you, you can just uh, get the method names, class names, and fields, and so on. Now what if, if I, I, I'm uh, dynamically loading a class, and uh, I did, did some modifications over there, so does hot swap or fast swap can help it, it depends how the class loading works. If, if you're uh, loading the class for the first time, uh, then dynamically, yeah. then uh, the, you will see the changes, but on the next one, uh, you won't. What if it's an iterative process? Sorry? What if it is an iterative process and if oh, I, if, if you're inside a method and uh, you don't uh, leave the frame, it won't reload it until you leave, actually leave the frame. So if if you're in a method free, uh, frame, uh, method for frame and you're you're doing stuff there and you're changing your method, then it will reload once you re-enter it. So yeah. You're using a spring? Uh huh, and stuff. You change the configuration file. Uh huh, some. Okay, some spring coming. Some spring file. So, does it take the pandemic? Will it take the changes? Uh huh. Okay, which which configuration? So, so you have spring, you have struts, you have configuration files, you're changing the configuration. So, you, you can uh, make the. Uh, uh, hard deploy configurations and uh, monitor for those XML files also, then it will uh, reload. Uh, sorry? How to do that configuration in case of any suspects? Oh, uh, it depends on your application server. So uh, you, you have to check your app, app server for hot, hot uh, deploy and uh, then uh, see how you can configure it uh, for yourself. Uh, well, I don't know the uh, bean name by heart, but uh, you do have it there, so you just uh, have to Google for it. Okay, yeah? One question. With Java Rebel, do we have any problem with the garbage collection, like you know, changing the options of the Java uh, Garbage collection, well, you, you can uh, eventually run out of memory, but that's are in uh, development mode, if, if you do a restart after five hours, it's okay. Or, uh, or, anyways, in, in development, you have to do the, you s still do a redeploy after two hours with, with Java Rebel, so you won't have that problem. You, you probably have to increase the burn then uh, size because uh, as you, you're, you're loading so many different classes, uh, in the, uh, actually, so, uh, after uh, four hours, you can uh, run out of the burn bin space. But not out of burn rate. Now, yeah. kind of the yeah. So, here you always have a chance that you are testing your instance logic or all the activity without actually having the same. Yeah. So, basically, even with the configuration problem, it's still be a better solution, right? Because with your unique testing, you want to test your code, not out the server box. Sure, sure. Uh, just, uh, we can test your own. Uh, development, you'll uh, it, it's definitely faster because you lose the application server uh, completely away, so uh, it's it's fast. So I mean, JMU is always for the development and testing. So I mean, saying that. Well, well, so then again, uh, once you have the test, you'll anyways uh, keep running them constantly on a uh, another server. So this the. Uh, Test-driven development is, is a good solution, but still, you could be uh, you could make it like faster. So, but uh, just the point was that you you, you can't uh, uh, decrease the turnaround to uh, zero with, with uh, this the test-driven development. And but these different solutions uh, uh, don't exist very well because. Um, 
even though you're you're maybe testing in your browser how, how this works in the app server, you you're actually still writing tests or hopefully are writing tests. But so one, uh, any difference between a JDK and Tomcat? Something like JDK and Apache Tomcat doesn't. Uh, JDT. JDT. Uh, JDT is bundled with uh, Tomcat Jasper from version five point five. JDT. Yeah. No, it's JDT. Oh, JDT. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and the question was if, if JDT can do something more than not that. Uh, no. Well, you, you cannot do anything more. Well, you can have a programmatic configuration for JDT. Uh, it's, it's, it's just faster, it's, it's more lightweight. Uh, uh, you, you don't get the uh, five default applications deployed to it as, as you have with the Tomcat. Once you use managers and uh, administrations and so on, so it's, it's definitely more lightweight. Like, so for JDT, there is no configuration system. Like no, no, you, you can uh, of course configure uh, JDT statically or uh, programmatically. So, so you just imagine it as a really lightweight container, because it, actually JDT is used for uh, most of the examples that. You can uh, just download, download one jar file, execute it with a Java jar, jar file name. It will spawn a jetty, and you, you just visit the URL. So it's it's great, great to uh, distribute samples with. So it's it's so lightweight, but but still it's it's modular. So you can uh, make make it. Uh, you, you can add different elements of the JE stack to it. Uh, well, it, it uh, doesn't matter because uh, a Java will uh, reload uh, stuff lazily. Meaning that if, if you uh, make a change to the class, so you, the class has a different timestamp, and once you reference this uh, class or an instance of it, the reloading take, uh, takes place. So you might have uh, problems if you do exactly at the same time from two threads, but you could run into problems, but then you'll uh, restart your swing app. So, yeah, so uh, when, when the two threads will access the same uh, class, will reference instance of the class, the reloadings will take place. Uh, I can't tell you where the synchronization is done on the reloading. Oh, you can't enter it. No, no, no. It's it's safe because you can't uh, re-enter the method. So it's it's actually the, the other thread is, is waiting for uh, uh, waiting wait, waiting on a uh, synchronization and there. So yeah, uh, it, it'll be okay. How about complex differences like one object between another object? Support that. Uh, it's okay. So. Uh, uh, no such uh, issues. So you, your your object tree can be as complex as your object tree is. So. Okay, I guess we're we're done. Thank you for listening. <laughs>